pleasure to be here. Good morning. Well, you know, last week, if you were with us, um, we had some fun, and uh, we talked about hungering and thirsting for righteousness. And in the midst of that, I was reminded after the message, my daughter and I went to lunch at Chewy's, and we sat down and got ready to order, and she said, you know, Dad, basically during the sermon, you endorsed gambling and smoking. Do you know that, Father? And I said, those were just good sermon illustrations. I also endorsed giving away M&Ms, which, you know, I found out later after the message that the lady I asked for M&Ms during the message had a bag of M&Ms in her purse. So I've had M&Ms every day this week, just so you know. But uh, I want to start today, if you've got your sermon notes, I just want you at the very top to write down the name of your favorite movie. Not hard, okay? Nobody's going to judge you, okay? Romantics, we know you're going to write down The Notebook or Pretty Woman or something like that. There's nerds in the house. I know there's going to be at least a few Star Wars people, right? I don't see y'all writing. Write down the name of your favorite movie. There's some tough guys, right? Most of the tough guys are sitting in the back, so it's either Gladiator or Braveheart. We know that. And then uh, there's my people, the people that don't take themselves or life too, too seriously, and you're either going Tommy Boy or Dumb and Dumber, right? (laughs) So you're telling me there's a chance. Here's what I want you to think about. We're going to talk about mercy today. Regardless of what you just wrote, here's what I know for sure. In your favorite movie, there was a mercy moment. Now, if your favorite movie happened to be a Hallmark, there were a lot of mercy moments. But in every movie, every movie, there's at least one mercy moment. I know I did a lot of research this week. Every time my my wife would walk in on me watching TV this week, she's like, what are you watching? Because I'm a simple guy. I'm either watching sports, right? I'm watching sports or friends, normally. This week, I was watching everything. She walks in, Jurassic Park. Why are you watching that? Sermon research. Walks in, Rocky IV. Sermon research. In every movie, there's a mercy moment. Because it connects us. See, where there's mercy, there's magic. Like, I watched the Jurassic Park, the, the mo- not the one that's in the theaters right now, but the one right before that. I had never seen it. I watched it this week. They even, at the end of that one, have a mercy moment between a velociraptor and a human being. Okay, that's Hollywood, people. That doesn't really happen. We are the only creation capable of mercy. Sharks, they don't understand mercy moments. Grizzly bears, they don't get it. Rattlesnakes, no. So don't go looking for mercy moments from wild animals. But mercy moments, it's what makes us human. It's what connects us. It's what makes us unique among all of God's creation. Now, full disclosure, when uh, George texted me about a month ago and said, hey, I'm going to be out of town, could you, could, would you be willing to preach for me these two weeks? Um, I immediately responded, absolutely, got on my next flight and wrote two amazing sermon outlines, two great message outlines that you may never, ever hear. Because about a week later, I'm having lunch with George, and he says, oh, by the way, I didn't tell you we're in a sermon series about the Beatitudes. So you, you, I'm going to need you to do Matthew 5, 6, and 5, 7. Okay, now, at, from a pastor's standpoint, from a preacher's standpoint, Matthew 5, 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. I mean, come on, you can preach that all day. But then you get to Matthew 5, 7. Nine words, nine words. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. That's it. I've got an extensive library at home. I mean, I've got commentaries and study Bibles, and I'm 
pouring through them, trying to find you know more than just these nine words. If you had come by Barnes and Noble Monday afternoon, I would have been buried under a stack of books there, looking for you know deeper insight into these nine words. But here's what I found. Sometimes the simple truths are the most powerful. And so we're going to jump in. We're going to look at, at these nine words um, very simply, but I think in a new, profound, and a more powerful way. So let's start with blessed. We said it last week that, that in this context, blessed means a unique joy. Remember, we said it's, it's living beyond your circumstances. It's joy outside of the circumstance. But that takes on particular power in this verse because think about it. If we have to demonstrate mercy, that means that something's not going great for us or it's not going great for somebody else. And so when, it, when the scripture says, when Jesus says, unique joy... When you demonstrate mercy, there will be unique joy to the merciful. Now, the word merciful is, is an interesting word. If you look up its origin, the Greek root, it, it means loving kindness. It's, it's actually those two words together. Loving, so there, there's an emotion, there's, there's an empathy, a compassion, an emotion there but also kindness, there's an action. So for our definition today, for those of y'all that are taking notes, I would define merciful as active empathy. Active compassion. There's a behavior connected to it, to the empathy and to the compassion. So there's two things you have to know about that. If you're going to be merciful, if I'm going to be merciful, we got to do something. International students are coming here to go to school at AM. Active compassion, taking something out of our house and putting it into their house. Taking clothes that, maybe even clothes that we would still like, but realizing we have an abundance. And then being active and donating them or taking them down there ourselves and delivering them. You've got a mission group in Atlanta right now. They're not sitting around the hotel. They're getting out. They're doing something. It's active compassion. So mercy requires a response, requires a behavior. And here's the other thing. It's going to have to be relentless. Because here's what I've learned in my life. The people that need my compassion, my empathy the most, they tend to mess up more than once. It's not a simple, hey, I acted in a compassionate way and it's all good. No, most of those struggles are ongoing. Most of those relationships where I'm demonstrating compassion and mercy are some of the most difficult relationships in my life. And I know they're some of the most difficult in yours. So it's a relentless behavior of being loving and kind. So there's a problem with that. I don't know about you, but I'll speak candidly and transparently. I don't always feel like being loving and kind. Anybody? Anybody? See, the front row's nodding. They're with me. Okay? Y'all in the back. Come on. Let's be honest. Being merciful is not always our nature. Not always our first thought. We're trying to get home. And somebody's asking for a donation. We're trying to get out of the office and somebody needs help. It's not always our first nature. So the question is, how do we cultivate mercy? If it's not always natural for us, how do we grow it? How do we become more merciful? How do we become more actively compassionate? So I kept looking through the Word, and I found something amazing. 
back up a few verses and go to verse 2. I'll start at verse 1. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountain, and, he sat, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Verse 2. He opened his mouth and began to teach them. The key word there is teach. So let me ask, who here is a public or private school teacher? Anybody? A few hands go up in the room. Great. Who here has ever taught an adult or a child, Sunday school class, vacation Bible school class? Who's ever taught somebody on this campus or another church campus? Who here has ever had to teach somebody at work, like how to do your job, or you're a trainer at, at work? Absolutely. So what do we know about teaching? When we teach, we build one truth at a time, right? We teach our children to add and subtract before we teach them to multiply and divide. And we teach them to multiply and divide before we teach them algebra, and we teach them algebra before geometry, and I only went through algebra two, so I don't know what comes after that. There's an engineer in the room that could, that could help us with that. We teach phonics before we teach grammar. So when we teach, we build upon truth. And so how do I become more merciful? Look at the verses that come before it. See, we've looked at one verse a week, one beatitude a week. But remember, in the context that Jesus was teaching them, he was teaching them all together. So go back to verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Jesus is teaching us there to be grateful. So the first step to becoming more merciful is to be grateful. Because when we appreciate what we have, when we're grateful for our circumstances, we have more empathy and compassion for other people and theirs. Who's ever been on a mission trip to a third world country? I don't know about you, but ever since I got back from my first third world country mission trip, one of my first prayers every morning is, God, thank you for hot water. Because when you go two weeks without a warm shower, sometimes days without a shower, that simple thing can feel really good. Back in 2002, I was a college basketball coach, and we were asked by the uh, International Mission Board to take our team to Ethiopia and help them start their Olympic basketball program. But in doing that, as believers, we were going to be invited into rooms that, that, were, that no Christian had ever been invited into. And so we were going to develop the Olympic basketball team there in Ethiopia, and we were going to do clinics for kids two a day in the summer in Ethiopia, right? North Central, or Northeast Africa. And I told our guys, we're going to have laundry facilities where we're staying, so don't pack a lot of clothes. We're going to save our, our, our baggage for basketballs and equipment for these kids. We're going to take stuff to the kids, so you don't need a lot. Maybe a couple pairs of shorts, a few t-shirts, some socks, and we'll be good. We got to Ethiopia, and there was no laundry. Anywhere. So we wore the same clothes, sweated through them every day, hung them out on our patios to dry, put them on the next day. I mean, it sounds like a joke, but about a week into it, I finally looked at our guys and I said, we got great news, men. We're going to get to change clothes today. Bad news is, Brad, you're going to have to change with Jason, and Jason, you're going to have to change with John, and John, you're changing with Eddie. And the crazy thing was, they embraced it. They're like, hey, I'll take somebody else's stench rather than my own. I'm so tired of my own. But see, it taught us to be grateful. Romans 1.21, you don't have to look it up, but, but I, I, I'd love for you to remember this verse. 
Paul says, for they knew God. Think about this. They did not glorify him as God or show gratitude. Instead, their thinking became worthless and their senseless hearts were darkened. When you don't give gratitude, your mind becomes foolish and your heart becomes dark. So the first step to becoming more merciful is to show gratitude. Then Jesus goes on to say in the next verse, blessed are, the mourn, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. So here's, here Jesus is teaching us to be eternal. What comforts us in our mourning? It's the reality of eternity. My mother and father have both died. I know the pain of that loss. I've lost my best friend. I know the pain of that loss. What comforts me in that is that I trust that one day I'll be with him again. So when we're eternal in our thinking, it helps us become more merciful and compassionate with others because we know this time on earth is short. It's brief. When we take eternity into scope, we can overlook some of that pain and some of that frustration. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18, Paul says, for our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory. So we do not focus on what is seen, but on what is unseen, for what is seen is temporary, and is what is unseen is eternal. That's Paul writing that, okay? Our momentary light troubles, Paul, shipwrecked, snake bit, right? Thrown out of a window, chained, beaten multiple times. Momentary light affliction. So we want to be grateful. We want to be eternal. And then Jesus continues and says, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. And there he's teaching us to be hopeful. When he says the meek will inherit the earth, he says be hopeful. Get excited because good things are about to happen. That's why in Romans, Paul again 837 says, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. The number one way for you to become less merciful, for you to become less compassionate, start to think you're a victim. Walk around with a victim's mentality. Walk around and rehearse in your mind how everybody else has wronged you. That'll steal from you any desire or hunger to demonstrate mercy. Instead, Jesus says, be hopeful. And then last week, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness means be vertical. Be grateful, be eternal. Be hopeful and be vertical. That's how we cultivate mercy in our lives. Now, one last thing. Blessed are the merciful, for they will obtain mercy. Or my version says they will receive mercy. So let me ask you. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Who said that? If you've got a, a Bible with red letters, is that in red? So Jesus said this. So is it true? Can you count on it? You and I live in a dynamic. We live in a tension between justice and mercy. You ever think about that? We want mercy for ourselves, but we tend to want justice for everybody else, right? Okay? 
Um, I'm looking at a young man over here with a Consol Tiger football shirt on, right? So think about, think about it. During the day on Friday, he wants mercy. He didn't do his homework. He wants his teacher to give him an extra day. I want mercy, I want mercy, I want mercy. But then Friday night at the football game, what do you want? You want justice. You want that referee to call the game right. I want justice for them, mercy for me. Okay? I'm married to a woman who exceeds the speed limit constantly. And when she gets pulled over, she doesn't want justice. She wants mercy. But somebody drives through our neighborhood too fast, the justice gene shows up. We live in that tension. That's true for all of us. Jesus says, if you're merciful, you will receive mercy. This is not the only time he says that. Um, in Matthew 7, he says, hey, with the measure you use, it's going to be used on you. Luke chapter 6, he says, hey, give and it'll come back to you. Press down, shaken together. Justice versus mercy. I think the other key to being merciful is faith. If you and I woke up every day believing this is true, that when we demonstrate mercy, we will receive mercy. If we really embrace that, I think we'd be falling all over each other in acts of mercy and kindness and compassion. People who are unmerciful, they put more faith in God than, I'm sorry, they put more faith in man than they do God. They want justice. Really? But those of us, tenderhearted, compassionate, merciful, our faith is in God, not in man. One last verse I want you to think about. Micah chapter 6, verse 8. Many of you know this verse. But, but look at the tension here. We want mercy for ourselves and justice for others. Micah 6, 8 says, Lord, what do you require of man? And the answer is, act justly. You live with justice. Love mercy. Extend mercy. You live as if justice is the rule. Do right as best you can. Love mercy. Extend mercy. And walk humbly with your God. Walking by faith empowers us to live merciful lives. So how do we grow that? Last thing, three steps that will grow our faith and grow our mercy. Number one, let go of the hurt. And I know, I don't know any of you well. I know that this is easy to say and hard to do. Some of you have been hurt by others deeply. Some of you have been hurt by others repeatedly. But we're commanded to let go of the hurt. First Peter chapter 5 says, the enemy prowls around like a roaring lion looking for somebody to devour. One of Satan's greatest tools is to get you to rehearse your pain over and over and over again. Some of you have rehearsed that pain so much, you've started to plan your revenge. If I ever see him again, if I ever got a chance to tell them again, if I ever, wait a minute. Satan wants you to rehearse your pain, and Jesus says, release your pain. To be merciful, we have to let go of the hurt. Second thing we have to do is to let go of the lie. We wake up every day to a media onslaught, to a world 
economy that says the more you have, the better off you'll be. Get there first and get there with the most, and that's how you win. That's not biblical. Most of us live with a garage sale mindset when it comes to mercy. I was running through the neighborhood yesterday. We live out in Castlegate, and I saw all these garage sale signs up. And as I was praying about our time together today, I thought, you know what? I'm, when it comes to mercy, I'm a garage sale guy. So think about a garage sale. Come to my property. We've put signs out. We're going to have a big sale. All the good stuff is in my house. The air conditioning is in my house. You can't come into my house. You can only come into my garage. Because what I'm going to offer you is stuff I really don't want anymore. Or stuff that's not inconvenient or uncomfortable for me to give up. When it comes to mercy, a lot of us are offering a garage sale. We won't go past the point of comfort. We won't go past the point of transparency. We'll offer what's convenient and safe for us and nothing more. It's not what we're called to do. We've got to let go of the lies that say the most wins, the fastest wins, the prettiest wins. And finally, we have to let go of our agenda. Parable of the Good Samaritan. Two men with an agenda on a road, going from A to B, past the wounded man. In our agenda, because we're trying to get the email box emptied, because we're trying to get home in time for the show to start, because uh, I only work till five. We have an agenda and because of our focus on our agenda, we don't see all the collateral pain that's going on in our lives. We're just trying to get checked out of the grocery store because you don't want to be there. It's Sunday afternoon. It's crowded. How about a smile? How about asking somebody how their day is and really listening the next time? One last thing I want you to do. Write down the name or names of the most influential people in your life. Who are the men and women throughout your life that have had the greatest impact on you? And some point this week, pour yourself a cup of coffee, find that special place where you like to, to, to be alone with the Lord and just take five minutes and think about all the mercy moments that that man or woman demonstrated with you. Mercy is where the magic happens. Those men and women, they let go of their hurt. Those men and women, they let go of the lie. They lived sacrificially for you. And they let go of their agenda. And finally, there's been no greater mercy moment in human history than on Calvary. Think about Jesus. Let go of the hurt. Nobody has endured more pain for you than Jesus Christ. He suffered and died for you and for me. Let go of the lie. We talked about it last week. When the enemy tempted Jesus, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, 
pride of life. Jesus rejected every lie of the enemy so he could fulfill his mission, which was to go to the cross for us and then let go of the agenda. You know, it's fascinating that if you look in the Gospels, Jesus continually talks about, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be handed over. I'm going to die. And I'm going to be raised again. Even his own disciples tried to take him off of his agenda. Lord, that'll never happen, Peter said. Get behind me, Satan. Mercy is where the magic happens. Mercy is what sets us apart as human beings. And brothers and sisters in Christ, it's our mercy that sets us apart from the world. It's that we'll do it repeatedly, that we'll do it relentlessly, and that we'll do it sacrificially because that's what Jesus did for us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your mercy.